Okay. Hello and welcome to our March Ask a Physicist. Um, before we get started, I just want to remind everybody about our Beyond Annual Lecture coming up on April 14th with Dr. Cyan Proctor. Uh, the links for registration for both in-person and virtual can be found on the Beyond Center website. There will be a book signing afterwards with a limited amount of books for sale, but you can purchase the book in advance and bring it with you to have signed. The link to her book can also be found on our website, or you can just search for it on Amazon. In other Beyond Center event news, our next and last Last Ask a Physicist of the semester will be on April 25th, same time, 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. And we will have guest presenter Eric Hole discussing fact, emergence, fact or fiction. So be on the lookout for the registration links once that opens up. Um, tonight's Ask a Physicist is being recorded and will be posted to our Beyond Center YouTube. So please share it with anyone that you think would be interested that may have missed this. If you have any questions tonight, please ask them using the Q&A feature within Zoom at the bottom of your screen. And with that, I will turn it over to the director of the Beyond Center and tonight's moderator, Paul Davies. Thank you, Jessica, and hello, everybody. A very warm welcome. Welcome back to those of our regulars and a special welcome to any newcomers. Uh, do try and attend these sessions. They're always a lot of fun, and this is your opportunity to ask questions of the experts. Tonight is no exception. The theme is the James Webb Space Telescope. And unless you've been living on another planet, you'll know that this extraordinary instrument was recently launched and is now parked in the appropriate place out there in the cosmos and we're eagerly awaiting the first results and probably the person who's most eagerly awaiting them is Roger Windhorst, my colleague here at ASU. Uh, Roger has been involved with uh, astronomy uh, generally but specifically space telescopes uh, for many many years uh, he's one of the six people who are, he'll tell you the exact words, but the international expert or something of that sort um, on the James Webb Space Telescope. So he's been closely aligned to that uh, for a long time. And he's going to start this evening by telling us a bit about what this uh, extraordinary instrument can do. And then uh, we're going to bring in Mike Lyon, who He's also here at ASU in the School of Earth and Space Exploration, uh, and he's a planetologist, and in particular, um, an exoplanetologist. So he likes planets outside of our solar system, which is what the JWST is going to be doing. One of them is going to be doing a lot, but you don't want to hear from me. So I'm going to, without further ado, hand over to Roger uh, to take you through the vital statistics of this extraordinary system. Roger? Well, thank you very much, Paul and uh, Jessica, for inviting me. Um, um, I'll have too many charts for tonight, and it's not intended to all be discussed, but you have them there for your, uh, for your information. And Michael Line will interrupt me when there is questions about exoplanets that he can answer far better than I can. Um, so I will not talk about the two big telescopes to the right. That's for the far future. Um, but Hubble's been in orbit since 1990, was first conceived before 1973, actually, and the James Webb Telescope was conceived more than 25 years ago, was launched this last Christmas, and it should last for at least 10 years, uh, hopefully much longer. Um, <clears throat> so that will be the topic for tonight. Let me know, uh, Jessica, if you can't see the charts. So I'll talk a little bit about the um, the hardware and a really brief bird's eye view of what Hubble has done on galaxy assembly and supermassive black hole growth. And then we'll get to the real meat um, in orange throughout what JWST can do in terms of science. And we'll talk about the epoch of first light in galaxy assembly and black hole growth. And that's about as far as we'll get. And then as the, the exoplanets will uh, be covered by Mike. You have the, the link to the talk there. The first thing I want to remind you of that these NASA flagship missions are um, 
career long projects they 30 to 40 years at, at minimum Hubble's been around for more than half a century and been in orbit for almost 32 years next month and so in other words you will feel wrinkled before you know it and, and Webb's been as I said on the drawing board for over 20 years and now was finally ready to launch this last um, um, Christmas so Hubble, the astronomer, discovered the expansion of the universe. I assume you can see my cursor here. And um, Hubble, the telescope, of course, is named after him. Um, James Webb was the um, second NASA administrator under JFK, and he was the one that stood up to JFK when Kennedy said, we want to go to the moon. And Mr. Webb said, Mr. Mr. President, if we go to the moon, we want to find out what's there. So he was the one that actually invented uh, space science. Um, Hubble is a little bit bigger than the diameter of the size of a human being, 2.4 meters in diameter for the primary mirror. Webb is two and a half times larger at six and a half meter edge to edge. That means at uh, two and a half times longer wavelengths, it will have the same resolution as Hubble and at the same wavelength, it will do two and a half times better because the sensitivity goes as the second or fourth power of the mirror diameter. Um, size really does matter. We will go much fainter with Webb. It's also an infrared telescope. So you look further into the infrared where the universe was younger at larger redshifts and where stars started to shine inside their dusty cocoons. We'll see some images of that. I don't want to say too much about this other than that uh, the real life size web here, that's not the real thing, of course, being traveling with the prime contractor on various displays here in front of uh, um, Congress. Um, you can see how big it is. It's really tennis court size. That's not the real thing. You will see the hardware in a minute. Um, so it got these five layers of Kapton sun shield that um, hold the temperature at um, around 40 to 45 kelvins. On the sunny side, which is always at the bottom of the uh, engineering drawing here, um, it will be around 300 kelvins or a little warmer, close to 400 kelvins here and there. On the dark side, and this side is supposed to always be in the dark, it will be uh, 40 kelvin. Each of these layers of Kapton, it's like the saran wrap in which you uh, wrap your kitchen uh, leftover food every night. Um, but it's much stronger than uh, saran wrap. It's also much more reflective. And that's why at this temperature over on the other side, you can see to what astronomers call 31st magnitude and uh, what physicists call about one uh, nanogensky for the non-expert, that would be about one firefly as seen from the distance of the moon with the moon not there. So that will be my unit for flux tonight, one firefly at the moon's distance. Uh, let's see. So it went up. We'll see the launch pictures in just a minute in Ariane 5, where it was neatly folded up in the uh, launch fairing. And after um, nine minutes, the fairing came off and it deployed. I will spare you the, the video, show you some real pictures in just a minute. Um, first of all, where did we go? From the Earth over here with the moon, um, this white orbit. We went four or five times further than the moon in a virtual point that goes around the sun with the earth and the moon every 365 days. This point is enormous in size. It's about a million kilometers in both the X, Y, and Z direction. And it's semi-stable. We call it the Lagrange point. And once you're there, you can freely float with the earth. And if you just align the sun shield just right, you will always be in the dark because the earth and the moon and the sun will always be behind the sun shield. This is dramatically different from Hubble. Hubble, of course, goes around the Earth every 96 minutes, and it therefore sees 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets every day. With Webb, we had one sunrise when the fairing opened and one sunset when the sun shield deployed a few months ago. And for the rest, it will be in darkness for 10 or 20 years, as it should be. Um, this is how the telescope gets deployed. All these deployments were done. So that is history. I won't say much about it. I have a movie in case you want to see that. But uh, just to remind you that each of these mirrors is made out of beryllium. It's 1.35 meters in diameter edge to edge. 
It's very lightweight. Beryllium is in the upper left corner of the periodic system, just above aluminum. And it behaves like aluminum, except it is much less subject to thermal expansion and contraction. So when you polish it at room temperature and you bring it down to 40 Kelvin, it has almost the same shape as the temperature you polished it at. So it's very stable. Behind each mirror segment are these six mechanical fingers. We call them actuators or hexapods. And with uh, redundant functionality, they uh, apply six or seven free parameters, namely the position, the, the X, Y position, the tip and the tilt of the mirror, the rotation and the radius of curvature. And that means that um, you will see the images in a minute. We can actually um, <clears throat> get more or less the exact focus over the entire six and a half meter aperture. Um, these are all the components that were uh, assembled over the last 10 years. I'll spare you all the details other than saying that um, all the mirrors, including the secondary mirror here, this was before it was coded. They're all gold coded. That's not because the project has so much money, but it's because uh, it gives you very high reflectivity uh, in the infrared. And, you know, gold, as you know, from a wedding ring is yellow and therefore all the long wavelengths reflect really well, short wavelengths not so well. And so it's a perfect infrared telescope, weighs 6,500 kilograms. This was the... Um, Lego building block plan. It took us 10 years to design and 10 years to build, to build, but here we are. This was the hardware as we went. Uh, Sunshield was probably the hardest thing to do and the most critical to deploy. It was not clear that it would work, but after a lot of testing, they convinced themselves that it would work. Here you see a NASA having all its ducks in a row around the Sunshield. I've been inside the central hall where the telescope got lift, lifted out from. It's quite a sight to see this. And of course, this had to be all done in a very clean chamber before it was all mounted. All these mirrors were mounted with the cover on top with the mechanical arm here. And that took a better part of uh, the last uh, decade. Um, here you see the mirrors covered up uh, as they needed to be because we anticipated that it would be staring at the ceiling for a number of years because of all the delays and indeed it did. So I can guarantee you there's very li little dust on the surface of these mirrors or water as there shouldn't be because when Michael Lyon gets to talk about the exoplanets, he wants to find water in the atmosphere of these exoplanets. You can't do that if there is water frozen on top of these mirrors. So how do you keep these mirrors clean with the cover? How do you get the covers off? Well, before launch, you have two sets of Olympic divers on diving boards, very carefully remove them. Um, that was the telescope before it was mounted on the, the spacecraft and the, um, um, the sun shield. I want to call the attention to this big NASA logo here uh, on the wall in building 29 of Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. The telescope is sitting on this giant merry-go-round. You can point it every which way. So in the next slide, you can see the telescope looking at the logo, which is now behind me on the wall. And here's the team with John Mather, the Nobel laureate, who is cracking the whip. And you can see that the NASA logo is in a mirror image and it's enlarged so the telescope works. This is when we knew that the telescope more or less did the right thing. And of course, we've extensively tested it since then. Um, these are the instruments it has. Michael Lyon may tell you a little bit more about this, but at first we have a guiding sensor, infrared detector that holds the images still while the other cameras are exposing or taking spectra, a very high precision a fraction of a milli arc second. The near infrared camera built by our colleague Marcia Ricci at the U of A that works between one and five micron doubly redundant instruments with uh, various detectors. Then there's a near infrared spectrograph that analyzes the light as a function of wavelength. So you can find that water or perhaps oxygen or ozone on these exoplanets, which will be a long shot, but we're gonna try. And then there's a mid infrared instrument that works between five and 29 microns that helps you uh, delineate the uh, chemistry of these astronomical uh, uh, bodies. More than uh, 27 states in the US have contributed to um, uh, web, including Arizona and more than 16 countries in Europe and of course, Canada. Uh, Europe also providing the launch vehicle. This is how we take spectra. We know that, let's say, for a star cluster or a cluster of galaxies taking an image first, that at certain locations there will be galaxies or stars. And then we want to analyze that light 
in, in a rainbow as a function of wavelength. So we can uh, find the chemical composition and the redshift of these objects. And so there are these little mechanical windows that can open or close uh, with a magnet uh, that you will open, of course, when you know there's going to be a galaxy or a star there. You can make any pattern you like, the 64,000 of them four times repeated, uh, but some of them are non-functional or they're closed, uh, you know, stuck closed. There were a few that were stuck open, but by and large, you can take a series of spectra, these horizontal cigars of light over here of just about any object you want. A few more hardware pictures. You can see the side panels would fall into place um, with motors. We tested it out. Of course, you have to test it in one gravity and it needs to function in zero gravity. So one of the things that needed to be done is bring the secondary mirror over here with this a uh, hinge and redundant motor. And when that was done, you could see the guys run around in bunny suits and they were actually touching things, not because they were cheating, but they were offloading the gravity to make sure that all these motors wouldn't overheat running it in one gravity while you had to do it later in zero gravity. How do you test this whole thing? Well, <clears throat> it doesn't fit in the overhead compartment. This enclosure takes a uh, 36 wheeler and two freeway lanes, but you bring it to, um, Houston, where it's you know, in, in Johnson Space Flight Center, where we have one of the largest thermal vacuum chambers here. We're inside the chamber looking for the telescope to roll in fully deployed. They roll it in on rails. They cable it up. They have a test tower on top. They remove the technicians. They pump it vacuum and bring it down to 40 kelvins. And then they do a few months of testing, make sure that everything, every piece of hardware works. And, and that indeed uh, worked fine. It was a long process. Then they had to also test the sun shield, of course, with cranes and gravity offloading to make sure the mechanical arms, which you see come out here like telescoping arms you pull out, would also pull out these five layers of Kapton. Again, you test it in uh, one gravity, but it has to work in zero gravity. For the sake of time, I will go over some of the last hardware slides and then We'll open it up for some questions and go look at the science. So at some point, the telescope was lowered onto the sun shield here, which is at the bottom. It was mounted and there's a spacecraft bus underneath, which contains the batteries and the gyroscopes and the reaction wheels and everything else, the onboard computer and the data storage. And this was more or less the package that was delivered two years ago. There's the solar panels again, hanging from the ceiling making sure that the spring loading uh, deployment mechanism works and indeed they did. In fact, it was the first thing we saw deploy in space after it came off the Ariane rocket there is it folded up. Uh, this was now two years ago, a uh, couple of more pieces of hardware. We had to move the telescope away from that sun shield with a vertical elevator that pushed all 6,500 kilograms up. But of course it was a very lightweight motor because it did so in zero gravity. You can't produce too many shocks either. So you have to be very careful when you do all this. Uh, sort of the last stages of testing, make sure that all the deployments worked. And the very last thing we had to do is bring it to an acoustic chamber and a shaking chamber where you have a big table that vibrates horizontally and verbally, uh, ver vertically, make sure that it could survive the launch loads of the Ariane 5 rocket. This was actually the most dangerous part of the project other than the launch, because you didn't want to get an earthquake while it was, you know, moved across the parking lot with this, with this vehicle over here. And of course, when they had mounted it on the table, there was a Richter four scale earthquake in El Monte, California, two years ago. Uh, we measured that, of course, but it was fine. It was nicely bolted down, so everything was fine. Um, so let's go to the launch here. Um, it was rolled off to Kourou in French Guiana. It, uh, it left docks in um, San Pedro in Los Angeles airport, uh, I mean, uh, uh, harbor um, in September. And it arrived there in October and it two, took two months, uh, two months to mount on the rocket. And finally, on Christmas morning at five in the morning, it took off with an, an unbelievable perfect launch. The Ariane folks, especially the French there who operate this in French Guiana, have done a marvelous job deploying it. it was picture perfect. And the first picture we took was for the whole folded up telescope here above Saudi Arabia and Africa. And it's highly reflective, as you can see. And the first thing that came out was that set of solar panels almost immediately. It was unbelievable. Um, 
And then two months later, we took this first picture of images that were, you know, 18 of them, because all the mirrors weren't quite aligned yet. Uh, but for a number of, of the mirrors, the picture was actually quite nicely in focus. And for some others, it wasn't. And of course it wasn't, because these two here, B2 and B6, are these two mirrors at the bottom, which are closest to the sun shield, which back then, you know, a month and a half ago, was still pretty hot. So some of these mirrors were out of focus. So the last month, they gone through various iterations of step-by-step -step focusing all these mirrors. And here they were a lot closer. This was a few weeks ago. And about two weeks ago, this image came out, the first in-focus star. And this, you know, Mike, I can't resist saying this. This was done by uh, computer operators that were exoplanet astronomers. And guess what that reaction was? They were all excited about the background galaxy. Several of them said, hey, I want to go do extragalactic astronomy now because the galaxies in these images are so beautiful. Um, so that's it for the hardware. I want to open it up for questions and give Mike a chance to say something, and then I'll have some more charts on the first slide. So where do we stand with questions, uh, Paul, Jessica? Uh, uh, we, we, uh, we can save the questions until uh, Mike has, uh, has finished. Okay. Um, and uh, apart, apart from the one thing I want to say, which is you are the um, one of six interdisciplinary scientists on this uh, yeah that's right uh, what does that mean well it was the position that uh, john bacall and malcolm longer had for for hubble um so it meant that we got to define what the science requirements for this telescope should be so we had to say it need to have this resolution to see first light and this kind of sensitivity to first light and you have to keep the vibrations down to such and so in order to be able to see these very faint objects. I don't know whether I can easily zoom into some of these things, but some of these galaxies, oops, I guess I just overdid it, but they're just absolutely gorgeous. And so you need to have precise and still images to do the scientific analysis. And, and this those is, are of course, things. early days. Um, so I'm going to say uh, we, we have some questions coming in, but I'm going to let Mike uh, tell us something about the the promise uh, and the agenda uh, that is uh, going to flow from opening up this new window. So, Mike, uh, over yeah, to you. Yeah, I'll stop sharing here. Go ahead, Mike. All right. You can see my messy desktop for a second here. So thank you guys for the opportunity for uh, you know, giving me the opportunity to, to, to talk about exoplanets. Are you guys seeing my screen OK? All right. Um, so yeah, I'll admit, Roger, I, I was excited when I saw those galaxies in the background of, of the image too. It means that, uh, well, we might have to somehow correct those in the light curve. So they're going to be a nuisance, just like any nah, be fine. back to planet observations. Anyway, uh, before I uh, talk about the um, work that James Webb is going to do, it's probably worth just um, oh, giving you a brief overview of, of what we've learned to date about uh, exoplanets, because it really is an exciting uh, new frontier, and it's kind of uh, taking over uh, astrophysics uh, in, in stride. It's, it's very exciting. Why is that? Well, because there's a lot of them. We found about 5,000 exoplanets so far um, to date, uh, and many of them are, are nearby, not too far away in our own uh, galactic backyard, so to speak. Um, the closest exoplanet is about 4.2 light years away. It turns out to be about the closest star to us. It'd still take a long time to get there. One of the things that we've learned over the past uh, well, 10, 20 years or so studying extrasolar planets is, is how frequent they actually are. Based off the number of planets we've, we've found to date uh, and taking into account the fact that we don't see all of the planets due to geometry and other issues, uh, approximately every star in the galaxy has a planet. So that means there's over 100 billion, over 100 billion planets uh, in our galaxy, right? There's eight and a half in our solar system. So, okay, so 100 billion is way more than what we have in our solar system. So there's a lot to be learned about our own uh, solar system's place and Earth uh, in, in, in the universe. There are a lot of rocky planets. So that's a good thing if you want to talk about, um, if you want to talk about uh, searching for life on other worlds, we think life needs rocks. Um, on the order of 60 of these rocky planets uh, have, have the similar amount of sunlight that the Earth receives, which means they're going to be approximately similar temperature um, of the ones we found. So that's exciting. So that suggests that maybe liquid water could exist on the surfaces of some of these planets. Doesn't mean that there is liquid water, just means that it could exist uh, if it were there. Um, similar statistic, 
if you if we do the math on that about uh, 10 to 20 percent of stars if we correct for all of these effects like we might not be seeing all of the planets um, we expect between 10 and 20 percent to, to live in this goldilocks zone so to speak so there's still um tens of billions of stars uh in in the galaxy that uh should have uh the potential to to have liquid water which we know is an, an important thing so another thing we've learned over the past uh decade or two is the occurrence rate or the frequency of particular kinds of planets so we have earth that's fine so earth and venus are effectively the same planet um if you're an exoplanet scientist or this about the same mass same size uh, so we have one of these in our solar system. We have a Jupiter in our solar system, and we also have a, a Neptune in our solar system. What we don't have in our own solar system are these oddball planets, super Earths and mini Neptunes, forgive the names here, but these are planets that are between Earth size and Neptune size. And so we have to give them these odd names like super Earth and mini Neptune because we don't quite have a classification for them. Uh, and it turns out that these planets that are absent from our own solar system are the most common kind of planet in the galaxy. So our solar system does not possess the most common kind of planet in the galaxy. So that's telling us something interesting about our, uh, our solar system formation and, and what, what that means for, for, for us here. Um, sorry here, I'm gonna have to show a plot with two axes on it here. But if you, if you plot the temperature of these planets, the temperature is a proxy um, for, you know we all know what temperature is. You don't like it too hot, you don't like it too cold. Earth is sitting around this, this nice temperature, you know, that you're sitting in your in your in your room watching this. That's about what Earth temperature is. Um, so I'm plotting here, showing these the the different size the different sizes of the planets are on on the uh, on the bottom here. Uh, and so this is just sort of showing the uh, diversity of planets that exist beyond just their size. So we have small planets that are temperate. So that's like the Earth. Uh, there's a whole number of them there, about a handful. Uh, we have these super Earths that I just mentioned um, that are, are, are bigger than the Earth. So they're maybe about twice the diameter of Earth, uh, but they can be hot. So they can be thousands of degrees, uh, which would be rather unpleasant. We have planets that are very similar to Neptune uh, that can range in temperature to Neptune temperature. So cold all the way up to boiling hot or beyond. Um, that's kind of this, this artist rendition here. And then there's this whole new population of of planets that also do not exist in our own solar system. Those are called hot Jupiters. Why are they hot Jupiters? Well, they're the size of Jupiter, but if you look at their temperatures, they're much, much hotter than, than anything in our own solar system. They're much hotter than our own Jupiter by well, almost an order of magnitude or more. So, you know, we're talking some really hot planets. So there's a lot of um, diversity in uh, the planet population beyond what we have in our own solar system. So we want to study these planets? How are they different than uh, what's in our own solar system? So how do we do that? So the most common way of studying these planets is through a method called transit. Uh, so if anyone uh, was around or, or saw the, the transit uh, of Venus, I think it was 2012 and, and also in uh, 2017, um, what you would see is you'd see a, a like an opaque black disk pass in front of the sun. If you were to take a picture every few minutes, you'd see this black disk move in front of the sun. Uh, and what's really cool about that is that you can measure the size of the planet. That's how we know the diameters of these planets is when they pass in front of the star like this. And so there's, there's all sorts of information we can get out of this. We can also measure the masses of these planets. And if we combine the mass of the planet and the size of the planet, we can determine what its bulk density is. And that tells us the material that it's made out of. Is it rocky? Is it watery? Is it made out of gas? And so these are the kinds of planets that we found. We've, we've been finding water worlds, so waters that are planets that are made mostly out of water and, and the different states of water, like ice and things like that. We've been finding a lot of planets like Neptune um, and, and, and Jovian-like planets and things like that. Um, so measuring the sizes and measuring their masses gives us a first order look at what these worlds um, outside of our solar system are actually like. Is it rocky? Is it gassy? Uh, but if we want to go a step further, we want to measure their atmospheres. And that's what we're going to be doing uh, with James Webb. And so to, how does that actually work? So when the planet, um, we're, we're going to do this just like the transit of Venus. When the planet passes in front of the star, we're actually going to we're actually going to look at the light at different wavelengths when that happens as the planet is moving in front of the star. So starlight from the sun is going to interact with the different molecules uh, in the atmosphere. 
And the different molecules are gonna absorb light. They're gonna take bites out of the rainbow at different wavelengths. And what that's gonna end up doing, um, as you'll see here in a second, when the planet passes in front of the star, that's going to uh, cause the planet to look a little bit different in the different colors. And what do I mean by look different? The planet's gonna look bigger or smaller depending on the wavelength of light that you're looking at. And so if you measure the dip in light from the star as the planet's moving in front of it, um, you can reconstruct the size of the planet or the diameter of the planet with wavelength. And that allows you to pick out what molecules are absorbing uh, in the atmosphere. So the kind of take home message from, from this little video animation here put together uh, by, uh, by NASA is that by looking at the size of the planet at different wavelengths when it's passing in front of the star, you can figure out what molecules are absorbing. And of course, if you want to understand, um, you know, if, if a planetary atmosphere is having a, the signatures of life or whatever we think those might be, um, you're going to have to measure the molecules in the atmosphere. So that's the first step to characterizing the atmosphere or the habitability of a planet is, is measuring the molecules. Um, so this is kind of going back to that previous slide I had looking at temperature uh, versus size. Um, you know, thousands of planets on here. And then all of these bigger symbols, the circles and squares and the triangles, don't worry about the shapes too much, are all of the planets that James Webb is going to observe within the first year using this, uh, this, this, um, this transit method, this figuring out what the molecules are in the atmosphere when the planet is passing in front of the star. So the, the first year of observations with James Webb is, gonna, is pretty representative of the exoplanet population. Uh, so this is the science that I'm, um, I'm really excited about is what we're going to learn about these hot Jupiter atmospheres and the chemistry of hot Jupiters and how they're different from our own Jupiter. But there's also going to be a lot of work, if you look down here, observing a handful of planets that fit within that Goldilocks zone, right? That Goldilocks zone where liquid water could exist. They're at just the right distance from their star. That they're not being blasted too much and they're getting enough uh, for liquid water to potentially exist. One such uh, system is this TRAPPIST-1 system discovered um, about five years ago. And so what is this TRAPPIST-1 system? Well, it has, um, what is that? Seven planets in its own solar system. And all of those planets could fit well with inside the orbit of Mercury, right? So Mercury is the closest planet to the star in our own solar system. This entire solar system can fit well within the orbit of Mercury in our own solar system. So what makes this system unique um, is for one, it's not orbiting a star like the sun, it's orbiting what's called a red dwarf. And so this is a star that's about half the temperature of the sun, okay? And the diameter of the star is about the size of Jupiter, which is about one-tenth of the size uh, of the sun. Uh, and so what that does, that, that smaller size and that smaller temperature allows that Goldilocks zone to be much, much, much closer uh, to its star. So that's why we can have these planets um, that exist that could potentially have uh, liquid water uh, on them. So James Webb is actually going to observe all seven of these planets within the first year, within the first year. So we'll, we'll know, uh, we'll at least have a hint of what's in the atmospheres of all seven of these planets um, this time next year, which is, which is pretty, pretty impressive to think about. And so what are we looking for? I'm not saying we're going to find this, but this is the kind of stuff that we want to look for. Um, and Roger alluded this, to this a little bit, if we were to just plop Earth in front of, uh, in front of a star and, and were to measure what its, how its diameter would change with wavelength, um, we'd be able to pick out uh, key molecules like carbon dioxide, um, uh, a little hint of methane. We'd be able to uh, see a little bit of water. Uh, and if, if we're lucky, we, we could also see ozone if, if the conditions uh, present. Um, so I'll show a little bit of example of what real data looks like. So this is actually not uh, completely out, uh, you know, out in left field here. Uh, given the instruments that uh, Roger had mentioned, uh, we actually have the precision. So if we have the, the relative size of the planet is telling us uh, how absorbing the molecules are and then wavelength on the x-axis here, that's a proxy for which, way, uh, which molecules absorb where. Uh, with just a modest amount of time, uh, we're talking maybe tens of hours uh, maybe up to 30 or 40 or 50 hours of James Webb time can start to tease out these key uh, molecular absorbers in uh, these, these TRAPPIST planets. If the atmospheres, uh, these hypothetical atmospheres exist, if there's no atmospheres at all, we wouldn't see, we wouldn't see anything. But if an atmosphere of, of say pure oxygen existed, 
uh, with a little bit of water, we'd be able to detect that. Uh, we'd be able to detect the CO2, we'd be able to detect the water uh, with, with, um, with just a few observations with, with JWST. So that's really exciting. This is something you couldn't do with Hubble. Hubble uh, really only covered uh, the shortest of wavelengths um, and, and is unable to, to, to achieve the uh, precisions necessary to see these spectral features. So, um, so, so stay, stay tuned on that. Uh, we might actually have some interesting, um, interesting discoveries here over the next year um, or so. And just I'll wrap up here. Just because we find oxygen um, or methane or, or other or gases like that doesn't necessarily mean um, uh, we've detected life uh, on that planet. You have to consider all of the other possibilities uh, that can produce the gases uh, we see. But we think if we, if we see CO2 and we see methane and we see some flavor of oxygen and a little bit of water and we don't detect the molecule carbon monoxide, right? That's what your smoke detector is supposed to help you with. If we don't detect that. Um, this is pretty hard to explain with geochemistry. So uh, this could be indicative that there, there is a life-bearing world. But if we detect these other situations, if we just find water and, um, and, and oxygen, other, other mechanisms could, could produce that that don't necessarily mean life. Uh, so I'll stop there and just you know, let you guys um, ask, ask questions on this. So thank you. Well, thank you, Mike. And uh, your last slide actually addressed the first of our questions from of the temple, which is about if you detect methane, you know, is that uh, uh, a false positive if they're looking for life? And well, I think you've, you've addressed that. More intriguingly, she says that NASA has issued a list of target objects, which so we know what you're going to be looking for, but there's a mystery object. Uh, do you know what that is? Do you know anything about that? I have no idea what the mystery object is. Does Roger know what the mystery object is? You were hard to hear that for a moment, Paul, but I see several questions in the right. in the list. Yeah. You want me to take the first three on the hardware? Well, well I, there, there's one that we had uh, before we started about NASA's list of target objects with one that is left uh, unexplained or as a mystery. Do you happen to know what that is? Or is, uh, is this I, a conspiracy I, theory? I actually don't. I'm giving an honest answer. I do know this. There's a whole lot more than one. So of the in the first year, there's probably... 5,000 targets or so being looked at. And the first two weeks of operation, they will take some of the beautiful images of whatever they think will uh, reflect the operation of Webb the best. They haven't told me either what it is. I can only guess. I have images of what we did in the first two weeks with the Whitefield Camera 3 on Hubble, and you've seen those before. I bet you they're going to look at some of these with Webb as well. But uh, right. Okay. Well, we yeah. won't dwell too much on that. Now, if you're able to monitor the Q&A and have your uh, questions uh, that, that you're ready to answer, yeah, I can see you don't need yeah. me to moderate. So why don't you take take those you feel comfortable with? Yeah, so that, the, that might the, uh, do the same. The first, sorry, the first three questions are hardware. Somebody asked uh, James Benford, how much has web cooled down and how much further to go? So it started 300 Kelvin room temperature. It wasn't the same temperature everywhere. 6,500 kilograms doesn't cool down to 40 Kelvins overnight. And the hot side stays hot. So right now the mirror is at um, not quite 45 degrees, but not much above it. It's enough to be in focus. There is still one of the four instruments that was planned to cool down that's still cooling down. It has a cryocooler, an active helium pump that brings it down to six Kelvin. And while that was going, it made it a little warmer. So now we're in the state where we're waiting for that to sink down as well to the appropriate temperature. That takes another two weeks. At that point, everything will be in thermal equilibrium. That's all planned for. And um, then the mirror will be in perfect focus. They have already gotten very close with the image you saw, but there is you know, a little bit of fluctuations as they go. Um, so give us another two weeks before we declare the whole thing passive. And then of course, they're gonna take all these calibration images to make sure our images calibrated. And then in June, they will take the two weeks of pretty pictures that hopefully will make it into the newspapers either end of June or early July, that's the current plan. It was the plan all along. So we're more or less on schedule there. Um, 
is that the first time that we've seen these beautiful galaxies um, at this resolution? Absolutely. We've seen these galaxies maybe once before in a ground-based image when that star was selected. Um, I don't think I'm sharing screen at the moment, am I? Um, I'll go back to screen share, but at that point, I may not be able to see the chat anymore. So you will have to talk me through that. But these galaxies in the background here um, that we saw behind this star, we've never seen those at this resolution. So in this, and of course, we've seen much fainter ones than you can see from the ground. Um, it, it's actually hard to find such a star, you know, believe it or not many stars in our galaxy they're not single but they're double stars and they move around each other you know kepler's laws fairly quickly and they're not good for focus because the image will be elongated this is a single star um then elizabeth had a question um what are the benefits and our limitations of using infrared of course infrared is the wavelength of night vision goggles so that's why you can see you know cool things or even warmer things in the dark and it's literally the night vision goggles detectors that we have for very high quality in there. So the benefit of infrared, great question, is that you can see the things that are literally cool, that are of cooler temperatures. And this includes stars and the exoplanets that Mike talked about. It also uh, includes these galaxies that may be intrinsically hot, full of young and blue stars. that are seen in very large redshifts and that way the UV light gets shifted to the infrared and they will also literally look cool these are great questions so uh, thank you for asking and i'll look for some more but i'll let michael answer some of the exoplanet questions right, right. so the, there's one uh, by uh, Stuart lindsay uh, 1.25 times the mass of the earth defines a super earth um what's uh, so special about that number yeah yeah, uh, um, yeah and i can see the, oh roger can you can you is that me okay sorry yes go ahead um yeah, no, that's a, a good point. Um, so it, it's it's it initially was somewhat arbitrary the demarcation between these boundaries, but we've uh, learned over the the years uh, what defines a rocky planet. And so by measuring enough masses and enough radii of planets, uh, we've actually learned that anything that's smaller than about one point five times the radius of the Earth, or one and a half times, sorry, one one and a half times the diameter of the Earth, so just a little bit bigger or smaller than that. Uh, has to be something that's rocky, right? So you can build rocky things up to about one and a half times the diameter uh, of the Earth. So we know that anything smaller than that is, is got to be at least uh, a rocky. So that's why we call those Earth-like. Really, it's better to call them terrestrial um, is probably a better phrase for that. Um, I see a question by um, Elizabeth about, uh, about finding exomoons. That's a very good question. So we've been looking for exomoons for about a decade now. Uh, and we haven't found any. <laughs> uh, they're really hard um, because the little dip of light that they make, right? Moon, the moons are smaller than the planets. Um, it, it's just really hard to find. And we've been searching uh, using uh, what the Kepler Space Telescope that uh, was, was up between 2012 and well, 20, 2018, 2020, something like that. Um, that was, uh, that, the, it was hoped that that would find uh, exomoons, but so far we haven't found any. We have a candidate uh, exomoon but it hasn't been uh, fully confirmed. So stay tuned, maybe we'll find them in not too long. I see we have a oh, question from Matt. Um, have the types of planets detected uh, resultant capabilities of type planet tendency are common? Oh, sorry. It's, it's, it's a question I think about selection effect. You know, you show these uh, statistics for the planets we've discovered but uh, that's not what's out there. It's not a representative sample, is it? Because you, you discover what our instruments can detect. Yeah, yeah no, there's no, definitely, well, there's definitely uh, selection effects. So we're, uh, we are biased towards um, planets that are much, that are really close to their stars because it's easier to see them pass in front of their stars when they're closer. It's a probability game. So there's definitely some bias in the planets that we have found today. Uh, but when we try and backtrack the statistics of the types of planets that we have, um, we can uh, we can correct for those selection uh, selection effects. But of course, we can only follow up and observe the planets uh, that we've uh, we've actually discovered um, and uh, and detected. Um, let's see here. Uh, so Elizabeth uh, has has a question. 
uh, would the red dwarf uh, system mean that life would have had longer to develop due to lower temperature and longer cellular life? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, so red dwarfs, uh, they live, uh, they, those stars last longer uh, than our sun. So our sun has a lifetime of about 10 billion years. We're halfway through that now where these red dwarfs um, could live for trillions of years. Um, they, don't, they don't fuse quickly and, and, and go bang very quickly. Um, and so that, that, that could mean there is more opportunity. The planet could sit in the habitable zone for a longer period of time. So we could have more than just a few billion years uh, to develop life. But there's also a lot of baggage that comes along um, with being around the, these red dwarfs. They're super active. You know, we get solar flares and we see the pretty aurora and things like that. They're like that dialed up to 11. And so we think that um, the, the, the space radiation environment could actually strip the atmospheres from some of these worlds. So we're, the jury's still out on whether a red dwarfs enhance habitability or if they hinder habitability. So we haven't quite um, we haven't quite figured that out. Um, let's see. Sh should I keep going here, Paul? Um, yes, please. I, I'm uh, getting some complaints about the uh, the audio, and I think I might be the culprit. I've switched mics, so I'm a little bit. Well, we lost it. So you and uh, Roger should just plow on. I, I muted myself just so that there's no resonances, but when I need to speak, I'll unmute. Um, I answered two more questions. One was, um, well, I answered them by typing. Uh, one was on w which websites uh, can I see more um, um, news updates on? And I put them in the chat. I hope everybody can read the chat. Simply web.nasa.gov or blogs.nasa.gov will give you most of what you want. Somebody had a technical question. What do the rock, the, the solar panels consist of? And, and, and uh, are they single junction or more? Um, they are redundant. So there is more than one chain. I think there's four or five electrical chains there. I do not know the material they're made out of. So I bet you, you can find that on web.nasa.gov. There is an enormous slew of technical information there too. They're pretty standard NASA solar panels. Other questions you want me to answer, Paul? Any other? Well, yes, if I, let me throw in one of my own. Um, yeah. yeah. What, what's the shelf life of this uh, instrument? Uh, is it good for like 20 years? Yeah, yeah. so that's a good question. Um, Hubble, as you know, has lived so long solely because it was serviceable by the space shuttle. Uh, every part on Hubble was supposed to last for five years, but the average time, mean time between failures for, for Hubble, uh, um, batteries or reaction wheels have been three and a half years. And so, you know, the astronauts went back quite frequently to keep replacing parts and they got better and better over time. Also the, the, the fine guiding sensors and so on have been replaced. For Web, we had a completely different paradigm. Uh, we needed it to live in space for at least five years, hopefully 10 years without ever servicing it because you can't easily go to L2 and service it with astronauts. So we got the best of the best of the industry um, for all these things, especially the, the parts that break more often, like uh, um, the reaction wheels and so on, the, uh, and the gyroscopes, of course. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, we're still having um, uh, microphone <coughs> problems, uh, but uh, let me soldier on. Um, one, one of the problems, I imagine, is micrometeorites pitting the surface of the mirrors. Has that been uh, evaluated? Yeah, th yeah, that's actually the easier part because we know the micrometeorite flux also in L2. Uh, I have a picture somewhere. If I can, I'll try to dig it up of the Whitefield camera 2 that was in space for 16 years. And then it was brought back and replaced by the Whitefield camera 3 in uh, 2009. It was launched in uh, uh, 1993. And the outer shield of the Whitefield camera too, you can actually see that it's hit by pockmarks um, from micrometeorites. It's a titanium shield and we know the exact density. It's, um, you know, a, a couple of dozen uh, micrometeorites uh, per year. There's never been a true hole. There has never been a, a catastrophic um, a hole in any of the Hubble 
um, hardware. And that's because the size distribution of these particles as they come from the asteroid belt, there are power law. There is about 3,000 3, times as many of them that are 0.1 millimeter than one millimeter. So it's a very steep power law. And there is another 3,000 3, times as more that are 10 micron in size. And at those sizes, um, the, the impact, while it may create a hole, it will not be deleterious to the telescope. Now, the, the sun shield is different. Uh, these micrometeorites will go right through. And so since we know their density, what we had to plan for is to make sure that one, one of them goes right through at, at the rate of you know, a couple of per year per square meter, that they don't create so many holes that the sunlight will go from layer five all the way to layer one and make it onto the telescope. And with Hubble, what we've done over the years, I don't know whether you can see this dongle, but we if, if pretend that this is Hubble and it goes through a micrometeorite storm, which is basically uh, the, you know, the past elliptical orbit of a comet trail that deposits particles in the solar system. You want to park the telescope with the butt in the wind such that it, 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 the, the impact of these um, micrometeorites is minimized during those events. And they happen a couple of times a year, August 11 for the Perseids and sometime in November for the Leonids and some other ones, I think the Orionids in January. And so what they will try to do also for Webb is park it such for a couple of hours that the impact on the sun shield is minimized while not exposing the telescope to the sun. And while that is not a perfect algorithm, it should be good enough for many years to not create too many through holes. But, you know, in 10 years, uh, the sun shield will look like a Texas road sign. It will have lots of holes. In it. Yeah, but because we have five layers, it, it should for a long while almost never be true that the sun will directly shine on the mirrors. Um, yeah, we, so a related question from Stephanie says, uh, was Hubble ever damaged from space junk, not meteorites, but space junk? Ah. Yeah, that's a very good question. And if we had gone in low Earth orbit, it would have been, you know, not a good uh, prescription for success. But in L2, we are in this volume that's about 10 to the 18 cubic kilometers, right? It's a million by a million by a million kilometers. And it's an unstable gravitational uh, balanced surface. It's like a hyperbolic surface. So once you're there, including any space junk, you can't stay there unless you use propellant to stay there. So any space junk, including any micrometeorites, they won't stay there for any length of time. They will just drift off and start orbiting the sun. It's not like the other two Lagrangian points that don't have this property, L4, L5, they're stable. And you can find in the, uh, the Earth L4, L5 Lagrangian points, you can find little asteroids that you know orbit the sun with the Earth, but 60 degrees ahead or behind us. Jupiter, same thing. They're actually quite well known, um, but we don't have that in L2. So it, it's pretty clean out there. And it, it will be like that for one time. Now, Truman wants to know if something went seriously wrong, could we send astronauts? But I think I know the answer to that is no, it's too far away, isn't it? Well, if you ask John Grunsfeld the question, you say, Roger, I'll go any minutes. Uh, it, it's a two month journey, but it's not that much more risky than going to the moon. So in the near future, I think we'll see astronauts go to L2, like the next generation Hubble that's now on the drawing boards, hopefully to be launched. Uh, to be built in the 1930s, 40s, maybe launched in the late 40s. That, I think, you know, will be two and a half times bigger than Webb. That will go to L2 and be serviced by astronauts or even by a robot. You could think of a scenario where you just bring the bottom of the telescope um, with, uh, with a new mission and, and remove the old one with the old batteries and reaction wheels and, and uh, um, find guiding sensors, some of which have failed and replace it by a new module. Web is not designed like that, but for the next generation, you, you probably will do that. Now, uh, Samuel asks uh, a very relevant question, that these uh, things uh, just don't last forever, they run out of stuff. Um, and so what is it that uh, limits the, the life of the telescope, assuming that uh, that's not damaged? Uh, will it... Uh, <coughs> Uh, you know, lose its steering capability or what? what, what, what uh, no, it, it, it's propellant. We have two kinds of propellant on board, hydrogen, hydrazine and something else. And we use it for two reasons. We need to every two or three weeks, we need to give the telescope a, a minute thrust, a couple of meters a second to 
stay close to that L2 Lagrangian point. You cannot go across the top of the saddle surface, but you have to stay very close to it. And for that, we have about 20 years of propellant. And the other thing that will require uh, will take propellant is if you point at one location in the sky way too much, the reaction wheels start spinning up too much, right? You've got 6,500 kilograms that you need to move with these 20 kilogram reaction wheels. So if you want to move the telescope from here to here, the reaction wheels may need to spin in one direction a lot or in the other direction a lot. If you then want to observe in that direction, let's say the Hubble Ultra Deep Field for 100 hours, you spin up the reaction wheels too much and that will take propellant to unwind them unless you have a target in the other direction that you can use to unwind the reaction wheels. So we, we think we can have about 20 years of propellant and we're probably not going to be limited by that. The wisdom is that probably something else will fail before that time. Again, we have a requirement to live for five years and a goal of 10 years, and that I think we're going to meet. But past 20 years, we're going to run out of gas. Now we're uh, almost running out of time, but uh, here's a question oops, that maybe oops. Mike uh, could deal yeah. with. Um, how, how will this uh, telescope measure the ocean composition on the Jovian moons? Will it be directed at the Jovian moons? Um, I that's a good question. I think there will be some solar system science. JWST will, uh, I think it will look at the Galilean uh, satellites. I don't know from just looking at the surface how uh, they would be able to actually backtrack what the composition of the oceans are. Um, I don't think with uh, Europa there's uh, plumes. You could do this with something like Enceladus, which is an icy uh, moon around Saturn um, that has geysers of uh, water ice that shoot out. Uh, and so we could measure the, the composition of those geysers uh, with the James Webb Space Telescope. But we all, all also have measured the composition of those geysers uh, with the Cassini spacecraft that was orbiting Saturn. It flew through those plumes and was able to measure those compositions. So I, I don't know specifically what programs there are uh, to to actually study uh, uh, Jupiter's moons, um, but but that's that's a good question. Yeah. Well, for Io, it will be the sulfur geysers, right? That uh, they hope to measure, and then for I think it's Europa or maybe Ganymede, where they can see the water geysers if there is um, uh, you know enough. It's not steam, but it's water vapor that you know goes to. Uh, uh, zero pressure in space that they might be able to observe. Yeah, I mean, if there's geysers, you'd be able to see that. I'm not yep. sure if those icy moons in particular have geysers, but Enceladus around Saturn def definitely does. Yep. I think any solar system target is fair game, except Venus and Mercury. They are forbidden because they're too close to the sun. But Mars and onwards, anything is fair game. Now, looking at the clock, I see we really are nearly out of time. There's a couple of questions that I can just deal with myself because I think I know the answers um, before wrapping up. And uh, one of these comes from Sergio. We detect life perhaps on another planet. And then what, we, what do we do if maybe it's intelligent life or how do we come into contact with it? Well, um, I work a lot with the SETI project, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And any definitive detection of life on another planet would make it absolute number one target for the SETI searches for possible radio signals. So it's, of course, a huge long shot still. And then uh, there's an anonymous um, question having to do with the uh, look back time. When telescopes look out into space, they don't see the universe as it is now, but as it was in the past because of the finite speed of light. And we've been talking about detecting exoplanets, which are few hundreds or maybe thousands of, uh, uh, of light years away, um, so relatively close. But of course, uh, if you turn this instrument on the most distant far reach galaxies in the universe, uh, the look back time will be over 12 billion years. So that's to say it's taking over 12 billion uh, years for the light from those planets to, to reach us. So that's the basic idea. You don't get a snapshot of the universe as it is now, but as it was when the light set out on its way to Earth. Uh, and I, and I, I, unless uh, my, our two guests won't want to countermand me, I was going to uh, thank them and uh, just announce the next uh, in the series. 
Um, so, uh, all right. Um, well, uh, our huge thanks then to, uh, to Roger and Mike for participating in this. Lots of interesting questions. Um, I think uh, this is a matter of watch this space. <coughs> well, excuse me, watch this space. That in the coming weeks and months, we're going to hear a lot about the uh, results from this amazing system. It just remains for me uh, to uh, remind everybody about the forthcoming uh, Beyond Annual Lecture. Uh, Sian Proctor is going to be giving an uplifting talk, Space to Inspire. She's a poet, an artist, and an astronaut. And uh, I'm absolutely sure that her lecture will be really suitable for young people. So if you have any children or neighbors with children, anybody over the age of about 12, I think would get a lot out of coming to this lecture. And how often do you get to meet an astronaut? As you will, if you come and buy her book and get it signed, uh, this is your opportunity. So do spread the word among young people because I think it will be very suitable for them. Otherwise, um, we'll see you all next time at the end of April when we'll be addressing a more philosophical theme about the nature of emergence. How is it that stupid atoms and molecules can come to, together and form clever things like living organisms and thinking beings? It's a deep philosophical problem. Just remains for me to thank uh, everybody, including Jessica and our loyal audience. See you next time, and I'll say goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to see so many friends in the audience.